Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Think Tech Hawaii, time for responsible change. And today, we're really, really happy to have with us retired judge and author, Sandra Sims, with Diamond Head in the background, and mediator, arbitrator, coach, entrepreneur, and life guide, Tina Patterson. And for today, one of the things that we thought we might dive into, hopefully deeply, is how it feels to be a 21st century Black woman and see what's happening in front of your eyes right now, or a woman general. Yeah, we were just, uh, you know, reflecting on on the uh, new law in Texas and the way it in which is it has targeted uh, women to be subjected once again uh, to being the subjects of, in this instance, actually bounty hunters. I was thinking back to um, a piece I did some a little while back and at another meeting. Uh, looking at Fannie Lou Hammer's life, and um, you know she was a pioneering voting rights, you know, advocate who took on the Democratic Party, and was in 1964 or something like that. And she had actually been an actual sharecropper. We, you know, we talk about people who did sharecropping as though there's some sort of it's not a thing that's familiar to, but there are people that she did this for. This is how she that her family was as a sharecropper. And when she began to take her, this made the decision to pursue the right to vote, she was deprived of that. They were booted off their, off the land. The family is homeless. She was, uh, she was beaten uh, in marches where she was literally kicked and, and prodded by police officers uh, who, were, who were, you know, battling the protesters. When she was hospitalized, um, she was given an involuntary uh, hysterectomy, sterilized without her consent. This is an adult black woman. Uh, and she is not unlike many who have been subjected to this whole assault on the bodies of women as though everyone else has, to, has a say in what's supposed to happen you know, to us as women, it's, it's becoming, and here we are again, it's, you know, this is, it's, it's becoming maddening, distressing, sad, frightening, um, at least that's kind of what I'm feeling. That's when I read this and saw what the Supreme Court did or did not do in this instance. It was, it was deeply sad, sad for me to, to see that, to feel that once again, women are being, you know, kicked under, kicked under the bus. It just that's what it feels like. It's just starting to feel like, what else can we do <laughs> to, you know, to, to, uh, to, to make their lives miserable? What else can we do to divide, um, to divide women from, by, you know, by race, by income, by access to health care. What else can we do to stand between them? And anyway, I I got a little carried away. Tina, you tell what you think. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, this is really sorry. distressing. Don't don't I, I I'm gonna say don't be sorry. Chuck, that's a deep question and it's it's a it's an expansive question. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I think um when you said the question, I, I thought you know, of the two people that you could possibly ask, we represent um, experiences and generation, a generation that if you had a 20 year old or a 30 year old here, it would be very different. So I'll talk about my experience um, and I'll talk about, I'll answer your question to the best of my ability. I'll just say that. I think that um, the knowledge of the women who came before me has been critical in shaping who I am and what I do, what I say, where I go. 
I have been fortunate to have people reach back to me and make, make a way for me, open a door for me. Not because I'm black, sometimes because I'm a female, but not always because I'm black. There have been people who have said, yes, you're a black woman, you're a black young woman. We want to give you a chance. And there are others who already made a decision when they saw me that I couldn't do or I wouldn't do. Or I didn't have the capability and overcoming that. I'm fortunate that I had parents who pushed me. Um, sometimes you would say pushed too much, but they pushed nevertheless. Um, I'm fortunate that I, I had the opportunity to be with teachers who said, you know, this is a little girl who likes to read books. Let's give her more books. This is a little girl who likes writing. Let's let's have her write. But I'm not so naive to believe that it just was all my own doing. Um, you know, people have have seen things in me that I haven't seen in myself. And mm -hmm. it's that it's those moments when I hear about legislation and rules, you know, 50 years, no, more than that. 70 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to vote. And I would have had to undergo poll tax and other kinds of taxes, uh, pay a poll tax and undergo tests to, to vote. Learning to read or write would have been illegal. And so I, I keep that all in mind because I know I stand on the shoulders of those who come before me. And some of them who come before me aren't that much older than me, five, six, seven, ten 10 years older than me. But it's also those who didn't get the master's degree or the PhD or become a lawyer. It's my grandmother. It's my grandmother who, who told me, keep doing, I'm praying for you. And I know that's probably stepping on a boundary to talk about religion, but that, that is, that's all factored into this. Um, it's when I hear, you know, the, the legislation that we've been talking about in Texas, it's more than, there's this dynamic it's a gender dynamic. I'm not, and I'm not going to play it out as partisan. It's not partisan. It's a gender dynamic. Exactly. It's the concept of women having power, and that's what made me chuckle because, in our own right, Sandra is powerful. In my own right, I'm powerful. But accepting that and embracing that, if we embrace it ourselves, we're told not to. You know, you're supposed to be sugar and spice and everything nice, and you know saying that you you embrace your power. Oh, well, you are fill in the blank, whatever word you want to use. But that's also seen as a threat and a challenge. And it's it's that ongoing struggle for women. It's also, I think, what divided when I think about the women's movement in the 60s is recognizing that power was underlined, but who had the power was never really talked about. And I always think about Shirley Chisholm saying, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair, because she knew what was going on. You know, and yes, you know, I'm again not so naive to believe that it, you know, we're all sitting around the table holding hands. Some sometimes people don't want me at the table, but that's okay. I've got my folding chair with me. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Absolutely. I'm not hearing you, Chuck. Sorry, Sandra, you've been a judge for many years. I forgot my you're on mute shirt today. So, <laughs> and the Texas law changed things from almost 50 years of yeah. Roe versus Wade protections for women's rights to decide serious health concerns and decisions mm -hmm. relating to their own bodies and their own lives and their own reproductive lives. And instead of saying, wait, before we change everything in ways different from 50 years of precedent and track record, let's put a hold on this law. Let's take a look at it. Let's see if it passes muster because if it doesn't, then things should stay in place. But instead, they let it go. Yes. As a judge, not only as a woman, how does that strike you? It's very disturbing and unsettling uh, for, 
for a person like me who I, I, I am a firm believer in the rule of law. And, and it's and the importance adherence to constitutional principles. And when the Supreme Court makes that decision to allow a, clay, a case so clearly questionable, so clearly unconstitutional to just simply stand and wait for there to be harm imposed on people before they you know, take a look at it was, I, I, to be honest, I was, I was quite shocked. Even though we, you know, we say we have this very conservative, you know, court, I still believe in that even in that situation, whatever your label you wish to aspire, attribute to yourself, the rule of law says that in that situation, let's take a look at this before we make a determination. This needs to be looked at. This is unlike anything we've ever seen before. We know what's what's coming. We know what's underneath it. It's unlike anything we've seen before. We can't just let it stand because someone's going to be harmed by this. And when that did not happen, I, I it hurt. You know, as a judge, it hurt to see that, and and of course to it hurt. I, I, I think that's the what the one feeling I had at the time that hit me more than anything else was the fact that uh, we've come so very, very far. We've looked at so many things that um, so many injustices in our system have been addressed by our courts, particularly in our, you know, coming out of the 70s and so forth. Those decisions came out of the Supreme Court who just examined everything and made us all really believe that this is where our our justice would prevail, whatever we're going, justice is going to prevail because th this is, I don't know, I just, I just felt sad. I still feel sad and hurt. And that's our highest court. It's and, the highest court. It's the highest, and, and I, I just, it, it really did. And I'm, I, I think I can't, I'm, I'm wanting to sound very, you know, intellectual and wise and all of those things about what this did, but it hurt. It just simply hurt to see our Supreme Court do this. It hurt. Both ironic and striking. Texas is the 14th state, as I understand it, to enact legislation that would essentially prohibit, prohibit abortion within the first trimester, allow penalties and prohibitions for first trimester abortion, directly contrary to Roe versus Wade in the law of the land for almost 50 years. 13 of those states' laws have been struck down by the court, right. by the district judges. And the Supremes didn't even mention that in, in letting it go. And one of the things that has to be painful for all of us is we may have had a pretty good idea of where the four guys would go, although hopefully one of them would have some judicial independence, but didn't. But to have a woman be the swing vote, a woman who probably shouldn't be there well, that, for lots there's, of reasons. There's that. <laughs> and suit is now brought on behalf of the United States Department of Justice uh, by the man as AG who probably should be there and should have cast. Yeah, that you know, I problem. hadn't thought about that part of it, but yeah, there's that. Oh my goodness, you're right, Chuck. I hadn't even, I, I, I missed that one mm -hmm. because his, his, uh, his appointment was rejected. So when my friend from Australia oh, had brought that up, Oh, and he said, you know, you guys are really screwed up. We are. Dang All it, we really is, are. Oh my God, I didn't even think about that. Me either. Oh. So we need to put things in context and understand them in context and decide them in context. And we need to bring up and tell and share those stories. The Fannie Lou Hamer story the story of your own experience, Tina, and so many more. 
because the things that you're talking about ring directly on point and true with the pillars of caste that Isabel Wilkerson lays out mm -hmm. in her book, exactly. Caste, the Origins of Our Discontents. Exactly. We need to share and we need to learn. Yep. Hey, so as women, how do you lead us? Because obviously the guys are falling way short. You know, I, I again, I come back to what we mentioned on, on other occasions. It's, I think it's our young women, our younger generation that's um, going to be pivotal in ringing about the kinds of changes that we need. Uh, to make. I know, you know, it feels like we're like starting all over again, but I think this generation is, is different. Uh, yes, there were the 60s and I, I'm going to hear the phrase, you know, okay, boomer. <laughs> okay. You know, deservedly so. <laughs> okay, boomer. But uh, I, I think this is a younger generation who is, you know, educated and empowered in a way that previous generations have not been, they've accepted and in, accepted their power and their ability to make change because they've seen it. They've seen it happen. Um, and so I have to be hopeful about that. That's where our, you know, leaders are coming from. Um, I hope to have been in some ways, somewhat of a inspiration or help to some um who you know gone on on these paths but uh i i am although i'm sad and hurt about where we stand today um with regard to this issue and and other issues that have just basically pitted pitted us against each other by by politics by you know by 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 health disparities by income I race uh, the cast, we're back to the cast. Uh, and always we're pitted against each other uh, in such a way that we're having difficulty just, just finding common ground. I mean, we're now in the midst of this mask versus unmask. I mean, even that has its own way of, of creating um, an artificial division among us that needn't exist. We, we were in a pandemic, there's things we need to do and we don't need to vilify each other to do that. But we do, we, 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 we tend to favor the vilification as, a, as instead of sitting down trying to figure out how we can work this out or have any respect or regard for those who have different points of view. But I have to be hopeful. And I am, I am, I really am. Look, what you're alluding to sounds like a matriarchal society. Um, <laughs> and in a matriarchal society, we would be leading, but that literally means that the power is shared for that to happen in the US. I, and I'm, I'm not saying that we, we kick all men off the, the continents of the United States and send them elsewhere. But what I am saying is that there's a recognition um, that, that, that there is power, that that power can be shared. Um, interestingly enough, I was in a class recently and the woman was talking about the structure of power, especially in the United States in the context of race. And she said, you know, when we think about property ownership, historically, it was based on the male line. So from father to son, from son to father, father to son, and so on. But when we look at the laws and legislation regarding race, it was based on the mother. So if the child had, yes. So if the child's parent was of another race of, or ethnicity, that child was aligned with that parent, even if it was the one drop rule. So you have things like in my home state, um, Octoroons, quadroons, um, mulatto, and again, based upon the parent, in this case, the mother. So what if we took that same thought process and looked at it in terms of power and, and how we 
how we shape, how we think. To, to the point that Sandra was making, you know, if we're going to lead, can can we take the best of and 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 apply that? Um, it makes me think about when I hear um, in developing countries um, the pro the programs where money microloans are provided. The microloans are given to the women, and it's, I'm not throwing any shade on the men, but the the micro lenders have found consistently that when the money is given to the women, not only does that woman take care of her household, but she also applies that to the entire community. And exactly. she shares the resources, she shares the knowledge, and the, not, the community as a whole is uplifted, whether that's the sewing machine that comes to the community or the baby chicks that later become more chicks for others, but it, it, spread, it, it spreads. And again, not throwing any shade on men, um, but again, this is an opportunity to to see the best of. Um, you know, how how do you work collaboratively? Not, uh, and it's not always necessary to be competitive. Hmm. Very interesting. And if we think about it culturally, exactly as you indicate, hey, women even in Western societies have been expected and demanded to be the relationship builders, the team builders, the relationship and team managers, the collaborators, the ones who managed conflict and enabled people to get past it. And maybe one of the things that we're seeing in this time is that who, women who are able to do that even in the political arena exceptionally well, the Stacey Abrams, the Kamala Harris's, the Isabel Wilkerson's as a leading author and more are taking the opportunities and the strengths of the people whose shoulders they stand on Fanny Lou Hamers and many others. Yeah. Can we build I, on this? Absolutely. I, yeah, I think so. And I think if we look at our our professions now, you know, there is such a greater emphasis on work-life balance uh, in so many fields. And that's been championed and and uh, led that movement's really been led by women as when more women come into the professions. Um, and now we're seeing, and, and it, not just in legal profession, but in, all, in, in the corporate world as well, we're seeing that. Whereas, you know, 50 years ago, you know, concern about your family life or was just unheard of and not something to be mentioned uh, in the, you know, in the corporate workplace, not to mention in the courtroom, uh, that there's a, you have a family or you have another life outside of this legal profession uh, or this corporate um, entity that you're a part of. So that's been an important, I think, aspect of our, our changing society has been fueled by women being involved, as Tina talked about, the sort of the, <laughs> matriarchal approach to society has come from women saying, listen, we've got to balance this. You know, it can't just be, I'm gonna, you know, 14 hours here and and there's nothing else. I don't, I don't try to look at, you know, things like issues like childcare and um, you know, access to, you know, to healthcare, those kinds of things were not necessarily the key pieces in our profession until there were more women involved. And if you look at women in leadership, nationally and internationally, off the top of my head, the US is the only major country I can think of who has not had yeah. a woman in leadership in recent decades. Yeah, we are. And absolutely again, are. not to throw shade on or pick on people, but <laughs> if you put our recent male leaders in the same room with New Zealand's leader, we're not looking very good. No match. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I yeah. shouldn't have said that. No, and it's exactly those skills, the relationship building skills, the consensus building, the team building, the diplomatic skills and the leadership skills to yeah. bring the country together. Yeah. In times of trauma and tragedy. Absolutely. So I think you're aiming us in the right direction. And hopefully we have some of the people out there who can help us help take us there. I think we can. I think we have. I think, you know, just even we started off with this you know, talk about what's happening with Texas, but I think the attention going there and people really seeing what's happening uh, to, to, to the rights of women, to the rights of young people, to the rights of, that we fought so hard to have, and all of a sudden they're just being tossed aside. I think that gets people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that'll be, because the, the attention is there now. We're, we're seeing that. So that's, We'll be okay, I think, I hope. And as we move into our last minute or two, then I'm gonna borrow from my Australian friend again. He said, hey, Chuck, you know what you guys are missing? Hey, not only leaders with conscience, character, and courage, but there's another C that your leadership needs, and that's charisma. Oh. <laughs> oh. And if you look back to the 60s, the Kennedys, the Martin Luther Kings, both Kennedys, Jack and Bobby, and others, they all really brought that to the table in ways that galvanized people. Hmm. Let's say charisma. That Barack Obama had, excuse me, former President Obama had some charisma. Mm -hmm. He did. I think so. Yeah, yeah, and that ability to kind of bring people together. But I, I don't, you know, he he was an exception, and I don't think yeah. we've seen much. Didn't see much before, you know, in that interim between the time you spoke of and when he came along, mm -hmm. and then certainly since he's, since he's not the president, mm -hmm. we've not seen that. It, that is a key thing because that's the thing that gets people, that brings people together. Because right now we're not together. We're all, all of this. But you'll need someone who can kind of speak that calming, you know, way of making people feel like they have a stake in it, that we're all in this together, and that we can pull through this together. We haven't seen that. Uh, we yeah. saw some, you know, with President Obama, we did. We saw, you know, lots of moments of that. But I don't know, well, and, and I don't, I don't know, I don't see anything, anybody on the, on the horizon either. Do you? I don't. I was no. going to say Chuck, but I know he, <laughs> he won't like that idea. But <laughs> Chuck, yeah, Although, you connect with yeah. people. You do. You've connected a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it, we may be, we need to expand this picture a little bit and the context a little bit. I believe that a huge amount of the courage, character, conscience, and charisma that President Obama demonstrated was modeled and inspired by Michelle. And I think she did exemplify all of those characteristics. For me, when somebody asked me back in 2018, 2019, who I would have liked to see in the Canada's position, her name came up first because she did exemplify all those things. And she brought people together in ways that were inspirational. She could talk to students and teachers. She could talk to nurses and hospitals. She could talk to politicians and international leaders. So yeah. maybe those are the Not models. About that. <laughs> You're right. But thank you for bringing home to us today that it's time for women to be given the respect and the opportunities for the leadership attributes that so many have and model to get the chance to show us the way. Thank you both. Thank you all. Come back and join us 
in a couple of weeks. And I'm sure there will be more to take up at that time. Sandra and Tina, thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Always raising the bar. <laughs>